for us and that for that purpose to store our hearts up to pray and to put the right people on our hearts to pray for that is a way of us standing in the gap for those who are not able to dodge the judgment that may be coming upon their life because of their self-imposed sin transgression and iniquities so Romans chapter 8 verse 26 we start reading these couple of verses here Three verses, I believe. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helped our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So here we have the Holy Spirit working in our life, working for us to lead us and help us. We already looked before how the Holy, Jesus declared the Holy Spirit's here to help us. He's our helper. And he's in our life to help us. So the next verse will say, And he that searcheth the heart knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. According to the will of God. So it's the Holy Spirit in our life helping us to intercede. Intercede for the purpose of God's will for our lives and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose so as we have a desire to or let our hearts be stirred up to lift others up in prayer in our individual prayer time and we're looking for God to move in that area of our life we're looking for as intercessors uh, God's will to be done in our life because God knows those that he wants us to stand in the gap for. God has those that he wants us to lift up before him. So as we do so, we can rely on God to break that power of the enemy in their life because that's what prayer is doing. Prayer is a spiritual warfare. And whatever level of prayer that we're doing is spiritual warfare. So um, God is looking for the enemy's power to be backed off of people's life, broken off people's life. Praise God. So God is in our life working for that purpose. To store our hearts up for the purpose of intercessory prayer. And go to Jude. We're going to go to Jude. Jude being one chapter. Jude starts his letter off, Jude being the Lord's uh, stepbrother, brother of James. But in verse 3 it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exalt you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So here Jude starts his letter off by had a desire in his heart to write about the common salvation, the, the common power of salvation that is, is able to affect believers' life now. But the Spirit of God went on and led him another way in his letter. But his desire was to write about the common salvation and, and how we had to continue continuing for the faith because uh, in his day, the enemy was coming against the faith and trying to contaminate it, trying to dilute it or what have you. And he used a bunch of examples, but I just don't want to get into all those different examples because it would take me uh, in another direction. But dropping down to verse uh, 17, where it says, 
But beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before of the apostles and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's encouraging the people who he's writing to to remember the words that were spoken by Jesus Christ. Remember the words that were spoken by the apostles. Um, the apostles had the apostolic decree. When they spoke the word, it became like precept. It became like something solid, a statue in the spiritual realm. And um, we're living in a time right now where the, the apostle ministry is being activated back into the church. And they, again, they're going to have that power to proclaim things, to uh, make declarations to the spiritual world and, and get things broken over cities and, and nations and concerning the enemies. It's what the apostles set up to do. And we not understanding how the fivefold ministry operate. People think that the pastor is set up to do that. The pastor is not set up to do that. The pastor is what the word is, a pastor, that a shepherd that tends sheep, that's going to look after the sheep and make sure they're, they're continually getting the right uh, nutrients and stuff and, and eating at the right place, at the right, grazing at the right place. So look at it like that, or uh, drinking, in, drinking the right waters and so forth. The pastor is looking over the flock. So when you're trying to get a pastor to, to look into spiritual warfare and, and demonology and all that type of stuff, they, they ain't interested in that. They're just interested in caring for the flock. And that's not their job, according to the Bible ministry. That's the uh, apostle's job or the prophet's job, to declare and proclaim things, to get the enemy to back off, or the teacher's job to be able to teach that with the apostle or the prophet vision is. And so, so we're living in this time when uh, as God was activating this fight for ministry that the pastor came up on the scene and sort of um, living in a time where the pastor is overpowering all these other different ministries of the fight for ministry when that shouldn't be because you need the apostle and the prophet if you want to get the enemy to back off. See, a pastor will let people sit sit around them, being demonically oppressed and everything else. Because, you know, he's like, uh, no, my cup is already full. And the, and the job that he's doing as being a pastor, he can't just duck, dive in there and start doing spiritual warfare, too. Got to take him to another place in his pastoral gift. So most pastors come to the conclusion, well, I'm just going to stay where I'm supposed to be as being a, an apostle. I mean, being a pastor and is caring for the flock. So, so Jude is declaring that. But beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before of the apostles and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the words that's going to sustain you and, and, and help you break through the barriers of the enemy. Jesus is the great apostle of our soul. And then he had chosen the 12 apostles, but everybody who's writing now, even Mark became, because he wrote that letter, that book of Mark, he, at that time of his life, he was operating as an apostle. So you could grow into the ap apostolic or the apostle state as you go through the fivefold ministries and understand them and so forth, but we're living in times when God was looking for a lot of pastors to make that transformation that they refused to make it. And they remain uh, as pastors. And you can see the reputation in the time that we're living in as a pastor, the reputation is kind of diminishing. And where the respect for pastors are not there where it used to be. It's kind of diminishing because it, it's not, because nothing that they do they did, they just didn't uh, flow with the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit was changing or bringing in the fivefold ministry or trying to fulfill it and gave uh, pastors the opportunity to step up to that plate to become part of the apostolic. Not that they should take on the title of an uh, uh, apostle or anything like that, but understanding the apostolic, because uh, some people they are, they would be the apostle over people who apostles send people out to do the ministry. So if you're in the church and you're sending people out to church, then 
person you sent out, you become the apostolic covering over there as an apostle. But if you don't, see, but you make the choice not to walk in that, then that anointing never comes upon you. And you never get a place to understand it. The Holy Spirit ain't trying to make you understand something you don't want. <laughs> so once you want it, and the anointing of God come upon you to, to graduate or go to the next level of the fivefold ministry or what have you, and you choose not to, then you miss your call. And you choose to continue operating as a, a pastor when he called you to not basically be a pastor no more, to be a, a, a leader over pastors and so forth. You can say it many different ways. So, Around over here. Then it says, verse 18, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last days. So the apostles, which had the prophet working side by side with them, was declaring unto them concerning the revelation or the prophetic word for it to come. And even in the day that Jude is speaking right here, that their mockers concerning the gospel and those who are turning their life over to Christianity and you know they and still today they have many different names of mockery that they would call Christians that you know you leaning on that crutch of Jesus, that crutch crutch of Christianity and so forth, you know. Not really understanding the power of the transformation of the finished work of the cross. And people start mocking out of uh, their own heart and out of being led by mocking spirits, demonic spirits. So, go on and say, how that they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk after their own ungodly lusts. See, I was living in time right now, people are not allowing the power of the Word of God to train, change their life because it, oh, it's only in the power of the word and the striving after God for this change to take place to be able to get the power of our past life off of us, the power of our fleshly life off of us. So people will continue operating in the flesh. So he's speaking to Christians to be aware of people who will try to come alongside and not really are taking on the transformation that the Bible is set up to bring in their life. And these be they which these be they who separate themselves central since having not the spirit. Having not the spirit. So he's speaking in a sense a person could, as we know in the Bible speaks shows us that in Acts chapter eight when Simon the sorcerer followed Philip, believed the word of God says, and was baptized. But when Peter came, who the apostle came, and got the discerning from God concerning the man's heart, that Peter called for him to go out and repent, that the iniquity of your heart may be forgiven. So he never allowed the power of his confession of Jesus Christ to come into his heart and break the power of the enemy and do the transformation that God does in a believer's heart, that is the separation, circumcision of the heart, and the Holy Spirit comes in. So what I'm saying, uh, Jude is saying here that people could op be operating in the church without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit because they haven't accepted it, accepted it to a point to please the, the hearer's ear, but not to please God's ear that God will release his Holy Spirit upon them. So Jude is saying that in the last day, the church is going to be full of this, this type of people that is operating under a spirit, but which spirit? Central, having not the spirit, says, so that is they're being led by their five senses still and not striving to be led by the Holy Spirit or the newly created spirit that's in them because they're Spirit is not alive unto God, and they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, so they got to continue. Uh, as the Bible I keep saying, looks to teach us how to walk by faith and not by sight, and be led by our newly created spirit, and not judge what our eyes are, are hearing and so forth, but judge by what the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts about circumstances and situations. 
that we uh, come into in our everyday life. But speaking about the people that's not interested in that type of training, and they continue being led by their five senses. Verse 20 says, But you, beloved, building, uh, says, uh, building yourself, it says, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying always in the Holy Ghost, praying always in the Holy Spirit. So being able to have the second portion of the Holy Spirit in your life where you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you praying in your heavenly language to keep yourself built up or keep yourself in that arena of discerning or to be led by God's Holy Spirit, keeping the Holy Spirit tender in, in your life, to be led by Him, especially in these last times that we're living in, as the Word of God is saying, we have to be discerning. Because it's very important for us to discern who, who we allow to come alongside and be a part of what God is trying to do in our life. Because we are in covenant with God and looking to be a, a, up under the covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ. And some people come alongside and they're not looking for that. They're not looking to be in covenant. Covenant is the highest form of coming in agreement with uh, God is what we're talking about. So the blood of Jesus Christ gives us, brings us into the most powerful covenant that ever was written. <laughs> with his life and his blood. So we come in, into Christ taking it serious that we are in covenant with him. We are in agreement with him. But, and to be able to let the Holy Spirit help us to discern who's not. Not to just you know, ostracize them out of the church or, or not deal with them. Or, but we look to have patience as the Word of God instructs us to have. So it says... Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we got to do it. Keep ourselves in the love of God, the unconditional love of God. The unconditional love of God. We've got to keep ourselves. It says that word keep is a militant term. term and we have to protect it. Protect what? The love of God in our life. So... So keep yourself. So it's telling you, first of all, we have to determine it in our own heart and mind concerning the covenant that we are under with Jesus Christ, that we're going to protect this. We're going to protect what God is looking to do in our life. Because we've got to remember, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that he made him to be sin, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So it's a process of process of us being made the righteousness of God in Christ. So we have to protect this process that's taking place in our life so we can uh, receive the full righteousness that we're called to walk in because of the covenant blood of Jesus Christ. Keep yourself. We've got to start off in the determination to keep ourselves. And as we determine to keep ourselves, the Holy Spirit who's looking to help our infirmities will kick in and start helping us. Infirmities mean weaknesses and shortcomings and so forth, things that's in our soul that could, could actually be uh, uh, overlooked by us and, and allow to remain there. But since the Holy Spirit is in us and we'll keep doing the things to keep them activated in our soul, then he will start helping our infirmities, our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our character flaws, which will lead to infirmities, uh, spiritual illnesses in the body afterwards if they remain there. Keep yourself, it says, what? In the love of God. Keeping ourselves in the love of God, because what? Uh, faith works by love, it says in Galatians chapter uh, 5, verse 6, the bottom part of that verse, that faith works by love. The, what, the God kind of love, the agape love that Jesus Christ came and he released in this earth that now we can walk in it, not in our own strength, but through the power and strength of the Holy Spirit that's working in us and looking to work through us. But he's looking to do the work in us first. He's looking to bring us into the righteousness, make us into the righteousness that we're supposed to be walking in in Christ Jesus in his work on the cross. Keep yourself in the love of God. And it says, looking for the mercy 
of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So everything is, is in a process to preparing us for what? Eternal life in Christ. Preparing our soul for eternal life in Christ. It says, of some have compassion. We're going to have to deal with people. We're going to have, the people that he's talking about, some of the people we're going to have to deal with that they're not even saved, but they're putting on this front that they are, and they're not even being saved. It says, of some have compassion. So the Holy Spirit give me a discerning that a person haven't really uh, reached that place where they are saved, or as we would say, or, or received the Holy Spirit in the heart, the first portion of the Holy Spirit that cries out, Abba Daddy, in our life, that we are children of God now. And that we're so uh, good at uh, putting on this facade or putting on a mask. And some people do that just to be around good people is to be around people sometime and don't really accept Jesus Christ in their life because, you know, their life, they may be single people, they may be lonely, all they do is go to work, go home, you know. So I'm going to start going to church and start going to church, but never, and people at church are what, friendly, greeting, and, and, and sometimes, other than that type of fellowship, um, they stick around, be at home, and get lonelier and lonelier, you know, lonelier and lonelier, but then they have opportunity to go to church and stuff. And sometimes it takes a while before they get it. Like Marshall would tell you, he came here for a whole year before he got it. But he was acting like he had it around the people that was here. Then we'd go over to Long Beach and when Destiny House was at the hotel, every time Pastor Larry had an altar call for salvation, he was the first one up there. I was like, I was like we driving back, I'm like, <laughs> How come you keep getting saved every week? <laughs> because I just, I don't think I have it. I don't think I have it, you know. So he finally received it. We're to the point where whatever barrier the enemy was holding in his heart to block it was broken through. That he could have that sure to his own heart, like I have God in my heart now. So, and other than that, he could have just kept on like, Acting like it was okay, because he had that personality already, you know, to make people think, oh, he's a nice Christian, you know. Do they even Christian yet? <laughs> you know? And so this is what Jews is talking about, in a sense, but he's literally talking about people that have come into the church and, and not looking to get saved and not looking to receive the Holy Spirit, and they want to continue walking in their own ways of the flesh. But he says, of some, of some, have compassion. That's God's long suffering that the Word of God talks about. That we should be long suffering. Have compassion. He says, making a difference. He says, and others save with fear. And this is like people who matured in the things of God and the Holy Spirit's given them discerning about different people that come sit in church or every day, every week, whatever. But the Holy Spirit that gave that minister that's ministering to the people discernment about certain people, you know. So every time I'm dealing with certain people like that, you know, I'm really cautious about uh, not them, but the spirits that they're allowing to remain in their life. Because the Spirit is watching me. I say, why don't you just cast them out? They don't want it out. They haven't grown to the place to know that it's even there and that it's entwined in their soul or anything like that. So I have to be very careful concerning myself. Then at the same time, letting the Spirit know that I know you're there. If I'm not, see, that's the difference between uh, the apostolic and uh, the prophetic a spirit that God placed on people that they start seeing, they start discerning things. Not for the purpose to point it out, you know, oh man, you got a demon, man, you know, uh, that type of stuff. You no, know? no, we're called as intercessors to stand in the gap. The person don't know it's there because the enemy's got a blinder on their spiritual eye. He's got a, a spiritual blocking there that's blocking them from seeing it, even though they hear the word, they hear it preaching and everything. And they may even get excited about it for a minute, but 
Satan is able to snatch that word out of their heart as soon as they leave here. So we got to know that God is a have raised up people around us for that purpose. That's why I talk about uh, desiring to grow into maturity. Keep growing into maturity because we're growing into the place that God is taking us through the door the right way to start seeking and, 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 and discerning spiritual things. Because we're living in a day where the enemy is on people and you start fellowshipping with them and not you know, being discerning that they are still walking up under the power of the flesh, the works of the flesh, and there's demonic spirits that keeps those works of the flesh activated in their life, and those spirits are looking at you. And they're saying, well, what are they looking for? They're looking to see how ignorant you are. They want to walk home with you. They want to go home with you and, and remain in your life. So we're living in a time that we've got to really become discerning. That's what Jude's letter is all about. That and he, and, he, and he talks about a lot of different things of the Old Testament, helping us to see how uh, the enemy works through people. Now we got to become discerning to a place where that we're interceding, and the Spirit knows right away when we're walking up on people, like, hey, this person's going to start praying. He's going to start provoking the revelation and the illumination and the liberation of God's power in their life by praying. That's how powerful prayer and intercession is. You know, and I'm largely showing you some other things about intercession too because we're living in a time where they, they don't take it to another extreme, a, a different extreme that God wanted to go. And God just wants us to understand intercession as if when he's called you to pray for others that you're standing in the gap. You're standing between the judgment that God is that God don't want to come into that person's life because he loved that person so much that he sent his son into this world to die for the sins of the world. So he don't want that judgment, so he calls upon his, God works through people, he calls on somebody who's mature enough to stand in the gap for that person for a period of time. For a period of time. The period of venture that they would turn to God. And in accessory, in accessory for the, we say the lay man, lay man and woman that haven't been, you know, ordained publicly in the word of God uh, by, by ministers or have you, that's, that's how, far, how far they're called to go with an assessment. They're not called to go and get together and we're going to start doing spiritual warfare. We're going to pour out and put some politics. They're not called to do that. They're called to stand in the gap between God's judgment. If a, a gathering of apostles to come together, they're called to do that. They're called to discern and, and pull down the power of the enemy over uh, nations, over cities, over communities, over families, and so forth. But the lay people are not. See, that's where you're missing it. A lot of people get seriously uh, hurt and damaged and and put a bad label on spiritual warfare because they're they're out of they're out of their position. See, and they may be even called up under uh, the apostolic ministry and apostle, and know his place and everything, and, and he's covering them. That, that's still not their office to do that. And they, they take it upon themselves to do that, and they the enemy attacks. The enemy attacks because they're, they're out of the, as Romans chapter 8 says, uh, and the Spirit help us, our infirmity, and help us to understand the will of God. The will of God, individually and corporately. So, not having a clear teaching of how the fivefold ministry is supposed to be operating because the, five, the full fivefold ministry is just being reactivated back into the church as an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And then the Holy Spirit's gifts, then God's gifts to the church, not having a full understanding of how those things operate um, when people leave themselves to assume, assume how it's supposed to be. Assuming how it's supposed to be when we're supposed to be being led into how it is. So, verse 23 says, And others saved by fear, pulling them out of the fire. 
Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So be, where we discern people still have the works of the flesh, as I teach it, the 17 different entities, still connected to their life in a way where they are, you know, they don't want this stuff broken off their life. They like it. The sin is pleasurable for a season. And a lot of the works of the flesh is different things that's connected to our character, like anger and, and rage and, and, you know, jealousy and all that stuff like that, that the Bible calls us to deal with in our life. If, then, if not, it turns into something else that opens up doors. The works of the flesh becomes spiritual portholes, letting the enemy into our life that's not supposed to be in our life as believers. Verse 24 says, uh, let me just come back to that. Let's go over to so saving some by fear, it says. Let's go to James. James chapter 5. Um, actually, the last verse, the last two verses there. James chapter 5 says, Brother, if any of you do error from the truth, and one convert him. So James, as the first pastor of the church, the, again, the Lord's stepbrother, um, he's telling uh, the new believers that he's pastor over, so they won't be you know, judgmental and putting people down if people trip up and fall. Brother, if some, brother, if any of you, assistant, uh, if any of you do error from the truth, says, and one convert him, says, let him know that he which converted the sinner from his error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. And we're talking about standing in the gap and instead of you know judging a person heavily and, and making a person feel more bad about the bondage that he allowed himself to come into, we start standing in the gap for that person, praying for that person, so he could be what? The areas that the enemy caused him to become unconverted in, he become reconverted in. So that's showing us what? The enemy could cause a person to, to lose ground in his soul that the, that's been converted over to God. But as somebody intercedes, somebody prays, somebody... Is, is, is mature enough for the Holy Spirit to let them recognize what the enemy's doing in their life. He's regaining ground in their life and start standing in the gap praying for that person. How the Holy Spirit leads them. He's going to convert that person over and says he's going to save that person. Says, uh, and let him know that he which converted the sinner is from the error so the Bible is just calling, he went the wrong way, he made the wrong turn. He's not seen sin no more as he's seen it before. Sin me missing the mark that God wants you to hit in life. He's not changing his mind about it no more. So this is how the enemy is working in the day that we're living in, getting people to uh, not change their mind about the works of the flesh. Really, <laughs> concerning the works of the flesh and people are living in a different way in God's church, in God's house of prayer, where we're supposed to come together and let the Holy Spirit search our heart, know uh, the things that are not right in our heart, to get them uprooted out of our heart, because we come together, and through praise and worship, and through prayer, what comes in? The fire of God upon the different things in, the, in people's hearts. The fire of God. Let him know that he which converted his sinner from the errors of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. Shall hide a multitude of sin. Because sin looks to cause a lot of different things in people's life. We've been looking at that when it could cause uh, uh, strings and soul ties and, and cords in the spiritual realm to hold that sin in place. But through prayer, 
the power of it to be broken. Then again, in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to start reading over there, where it says, verse 1, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. Christ is our example. He didn't allow sin to set up no cords in his life and hold sin in his life and suffered all the way to death not to allow sin to attach it to his life so our sins could be poured on his life. He said, Arm yourself likewise, Peter says, with the same mind for he that hath suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. So when we, for our life in Christ, we was operating in some areas of the works of the flesh, the 17 different entities, whether allowing anger to have its place, or, or uh, wrath, or jealousy, or any other of the works of the flesh to have its place in our soul, going unchallenged. Now we starting to let God deal with those areas of our life. Guess what it's going to be? A time of suffering. Because it's going to take some uprooting, like pulling a, a teeth out your mouth and so forth. So it's going to take some uprooting. So, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of man, but to the will of God. And for the time, says, for the time past of your life may su suffice you, says, to have walked or worked the will of the Gentiles, when you walked in lasciviousness, lusts, access of wine, reveling, banqueting, and abominable, abominable idolatry. Peter is writing to the Gentiles at this time, although Peter was, although Peter was a, a apostle to the Jews and Paul being an apostle to the Gentiles. Israel was destroyed, and they're all dispatched amongst the Gentiles. So he's writing letters to the Gentile world and to the, also the Jewish people that was around about there. So, but he's telling them, you know how you used to live when you walked in lasciviousness, all manner of lusts and perversions and what have you, because in those days the, the Gentile people had shrines set up to worship their gods and the way that they worship God was doing a whole lot of sexual uh, things that they did. When you walked in the seriousness, lusts, excess of wine, you know, they get drunk and go have an orgies and all that type of stuff. Uh, reveling, partying, banqueting, more partying, and abominable idolatry, doing it in those shrines that were set up for that purpose. There's Wherein you think it's strange, excuse me, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. So, God's converted you over, changed your heart, and you see it now. You weren't able to see it before, how wicked it is, but now you see it, you know. And God probably see, helped you see even the demonic that power that's upon that type of lifestyle and everything. So you're like trying to stay away from it. And people that are still doing it, they're like, man, you know, got strange on us. You can turn into a holy roller or something. You know? And so they start naming you and they start ostracizing you. They, as you're called not to be around them, they're called not to be around you from the kingdom of darkness. It gets you, gets, get you ostracized from coming around them, which is a good thing. And you push yourself around them too soon, then those spirits that's on them will reattach themselves to you. And that could happen so easily. I remember when I was um, came back out here and stuff, and I had to watch myself. And I used to go out sometime and talk to a few people out there, standing out, hanging out, whatever, you know. You know, while they're hanging out there. Uh, we're going to go get a case of beer. Who got what? Who got money, you know? And I almost caught myself throwing in a few dollars. <laughs> like, man, I got And then I remember uh, uh, a 
my friend and Larry Biddy's grandmother came out. What you doing over here? You need to get from over here. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> yeah, she didn't want me to get caught up again, right? She came out yelling at me like she was my mother or something, like I was out there doing something wrong. <laughs> she knew I was a Christian now. And she said, like, what are you doing over here? You need to get from, don't be coming over here no more. Like, you know, Bill, you kicking me away from your house? <laughs> but it was a good thing, right? It was perfect. She didn't want to see me get caught up. And, I, you know, just hanging around there, you know, and they, they come up short a few dollars. They looking at you, you know, you know, you got some money, you know. It's like, man, let me get out of here. Next thing you know, I'll be drinking beer with them. And so I had to cut that short. So you had to cut that short, right? And so the whole time, Although I was back out here from a men's home and stuff, and I was kind of rooted and stuff in God, doing everything I need to do every day, praying every day, reading the word every day, but still going around my old friend, my old lifestyle that I had more years in than I had in Christianity, could have been lured right back in, hook, line, and sinker. But actually, I was just going over there to, at that time, I was going over there to friend Lawan. Got a car. I said, you know, why don't you give me a ride over to the west side? <laughs> I went to Tony's house. And then after that, I didn't go around there no more. <laughs> and, and me and Tony hooked up. She became my girlfriend, became my fiance, became my wife. So praise God. But it was, I sensed that when I was going around them, like, this ain't good. You know, I mean, one time they, I was around them because <clears throat> I went around them and they said, oh, we're fixing to go to Los Angeles and go check on the, these persons we know, used to know out there, you know. So when you want to ride with us? I said, oh, man, yeah, sure. You know, I, I was trying not to be like, you know, oh, man, I don't want to do nothing with you guys no more, you know. So I rode with them, you know. And they, all of them riding. I should have been driving because everybody else had a fifth. I mean, a, a, some alcohol in their hand, drinking while we was going. So I'm like, okay, I'm riding with them. But uh, so praying the whole time, get over there to the person's house where we was going, and come to find out the person that just died a month ago. They went into a program and got out of the program, and then tried to go back into that lifestyle and had a heart attack and died, and smoking some cocaine or something. So I said, like, okay, so but. I was grounded enough in the Word of God not to yield to it, not to yield to it. Matter of fact, I'm telling them that the whole time, I'm like, man, see, when we used to kick it together, didn't none of us have no alcohol like this. We used to have Budweiser and stuff like that. You guys are drinking hard stuff now, hard stuff. I say, don't you guys remember when we was growing up, all the older people that was doing that, and we was like, how are you guys doing that? How are you guys doing that? They all died early. They all died, you know, even into their 50s and stuff like that. I said, now, look at you guys, riding around here doing the same thing that they were doing. I tried to get on them a little bit. Because, man, I wasn't going to take no alcohol like that. I don't care if I was in the world. I didn't drink. <laughs> you know. But anyway. And it says, in time past, of our life to suffice us to have walked or worked the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusting, ex uh, excess of wine, reveling, banqueting, and abominable idolatry, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them, says, to the same, ex ex to, says, to the same excess of rioting and speaking of evil. So I was with them, but I wasn't doing the same thing. They thought it was strange, but I was, you know, I loved them. They were my friends, you know, that I grew up with and stuff, but they had, the enemy had sucked them in deep. And if any of them are alive right now, they're only alive because they took the doctor's advice and stopped drinking. Because they had damaged their liver so much. <laughs> they drank some more, they're going to die. They said, they said, uh, verse, um, Five. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge 
a quick thing to do. And it says, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are, that, that are dead, that they might be judged according to, according to man uh, in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Talking about praying. The end of all things is at hand. It's more at hand than ever before right now. That we should allow the Holy Spirit to make us intercessors and understand how to intercede and what he's calling us to intercede about, you know. Uh, uh, Whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. This leaves it up to God and Jesus Christ, his angels in heaven, to bind the spirits in the spiritual realm in the second heaven. We need to bind the spirits that's before us, that's, causing, that's holding people's soul uh, and blocking spirits, that's stopping them from receiving the gospel. We need to stand in the gap and intercede for them. The end of all things is at hand, but you therefore, uh, be you therefore sobered and watch until the end. The word sober there is have well thought out thoughts, that is, have, be discerning uh, and watch again, being aware of your surroundings. You know, in chapter 5, verse 8, first thing says that be sobered and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, see, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. So he's using the same uh, terminology here concerning be sober and watch. The word in certain uh, circumstances be, is watching. Watch unto prayer. And above all things, it says have fervent charity. That's that agape love, that unconditional love. Have fervent, unconditional love. We say it like that. Amongst yourself. For love covers a multitude of sins. So love could turn a person's heart around. Turn a person's thinking around. When you're loving them into the kingdom. When the world is constantly pulling out of them and, and dragging them down and trying to pull them down. And yet they come around you, you're encouraging, you're building them up and letting them know that they can do it. If they get Christ right in their life. That they can do all things through Christ's strength. We're constantly encouraging and building up. Then I want to end with 2 uh, second, second Corinthians chapter 12. No, it's chapter 11. Verse 4. It says that we started in June, and June is speaking about people that didn't really have the Holy Spirit in them. And Paul speaks here and says, but, no, never before. It says, but what saith the answer? Okay, I'm in the wrong place. Here we are. For if he that cometh speak, uh, preach another Jesus, whom you have not preached, whom we have not preached. Or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with it. So here Paul is declaring that uh, another Jesus could come on the scene, another spirit could come on the scene, and another gospel could come on the scene. And you've got to be aware of this, that this is what the Bible says. And if the Bible says this way back then, how much more through the periods of darkness that the church has been through, and God is just awakening a lot of different areas of discerning back into the church, how much more the enemy is, is able to saturate itself into the life of believers unknowingly. So that's why Jude and Peter and James calling us to be long-suffering in, in the way of that agape love towards people because they don't know. The power is too strong in the spiritual realm to get the spiritual blockers and blinders broke off, broken off their life because not only the fivefold ministry, the full fivefold ministry is being activated back into the church, the understanding of deliverance is just being activated back into the church, which the church is highly, you know, opposing it right now. 
to say, but still, God is breaking through regardless of how the church and pastors or don't want to call it go, uh, uh, didn't want to graduate into the next call in their life of apostolic or whatever. God is going to do what he's going to do with or without you. <laughs> I want to be with, do what God is doing and not hold back, you know, because I, I'm satisfied with whatever call that I was called into 10 years ago. That was 10 years ago. You should have grown into another calling by now. Yeah. You see? Uh, so we're not called to be content in our growth in Christ. You're not never called to be content that you arrived and that's as far as you want to go. I just want to end reading this verse because i got to go pick up some stuff. Uh, reading this verse from uh, the, the, today's English translation of the Bible. It says, for you, gladly tolerate anyone who comes to you and preach a different Jesus. Not the same system, uh, not the one who was preached, not the one that we preached. And you accept a spirit and a gospel completely different from the spirit and the gospel you receive from us. So it's literally talking about that. That after receiving Christ and everything, and if you're not looking to grow as God, the Holy Spirit leads you, then a spirit automatically will step in because you stepped out of the flow of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a river, and He flows, and we got to get connected with the flow of the Holy Spirit. You better watch her; she's gonna get that hot one and be burning herself up over there. I say. But praise God. Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord God, as you called us to be discerning. Help us to become more sensitive to your Holy Spirit and how he wants to lead us and how he's flowing, that we won't get out of the flow and how he's, and how he's trying to take us and where he's trying to take us. And he's trying to take us into the will and purpose of God for the body of Christ that you have for us here, that we could be sensitive and discerning towards it and continue growing and continue maturing and continue walking in what you called us to walk in. We ask, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Jesus.